culture teaches men to deny fear and women to let fear control them. Yet, if we learn to feel our fear without letting it stop us, fear can become an ally, a sign to tell us that something we have encountered can be transformed. Often our true strength is not in the things that represent what is familiar, comfortable, positive, but in our fears and even in our resistance to change. A journey of remaining open starts with letting go. Yes, remaining open begins by letting go of the things we wish to control. The Reverend Eric David Carlson's message next week, our former intern minister will be back here, and he will be speaking about letting go. That service will include a special All Ages Blessing Communion led by Eric's partner and UU Seminarian, Kimberly Tomzak Carlson. Should be quite an experience. Bring your children if you can. But today, we look at an openness that is only available after we choose to let go. The soul matters question. On one of the yellow sheets in your order of service, you will find some questions. Question number four begins with, are you writing hurts in stone and kindness in sand? Are you writing hurts in stone and kindness in sand? We all have times when we hurt, and on this Sunday, we know of the deep hurt of the families of college students and the professor who drive, died in Roseburg, Oregon. Mothers and fathers there will begin to say, my daughter was, or my daughter did. Siblings are saying, me and my brother used to. And their hurt and their pain will remain with them for many years. So let us hold them, all of them, in our hearts today. But this is not the type of hurt we consider today. We are looking at the hurts we have composed for ourselves, often in reaction to things people say or do. The problem with swimming lessons. First lesson from Philip Booth impresses me because my first swimming lessons did not work. Here is his poem. Lie back, daughter. Let your head be tipped back in the cup of my hand gently and I will hold you. Spread your arms wide, lie out on the stream, and look high at the gulls. A dead man's floater face down. You will die and swim soon enough where this tide water ebbs to the sea. Daughter, believe me, when you tire on the long thrash to your island, lie up and survive. As you float now, where I held you and let go, remember, when fear cramps your heart, what I told you, lie gently and wide to the light of your stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you. I took beginners swimming after first grade, again after second grade, again after third grade, but I did not learn to swim. My mother feared water, and she told how dangerous water could be. 
and her fear of water led to my fear of water. Now, I recall when my swimming teachers told me about spreading my arms, but that didn't work. There were instructions to lie quietly atop the water, that did not work either. My fears had overtaken me. I did not learn to swim in grade school, but then right after eighth grade graduation, I almost drowned. A friend and I were in a boat, and he let go of an oar, then decided to reach for it. The boat was suddenly upside down, and we struggled to hold on to it in freezing cold water, the deepest lake in Wisconsin, the early part of June. My legs cramped immediately, but I knew how to dog paddle. I could keep my head out of the water that way, see? And we held on until the rescue boat came from shore. When cast into the depths to survive, we must first let go of things that will not save us. Then we must reach for the things that can, said the Reverend Morris Church. That scare led me, then over six foot tall, to my fourth try at beginner's swimming. I developed a more gracious appreciation of the water that time, and I soon learned how to swim. Grace. We do not discuss grace on a regular basis in this UU church, probably in many other UU churches either. But do you ever think of grace? I have. And I know that many of the definitions I have heard of grace are inadequate. Grace sounds so quiet, peaceful, soothing, that it is often thought to be inactive. And this is the way this word is often used. Oh, grace happened. But I see grace as being one of the best blessings we can receive. I see it in the role of our life's unrolling and us being a container in that role that receives some amazing help and it seems to arrive from nowhere. In my view, grace is always active. As the Hindu teacher Ahmad says, words we heard earlier, grace is openness. By remaining open, you let go of your ego and narrow-minded views and allow divine grace to express itself through you. Allow divine grace to express itself through you. Ahmad describes two mischief makers that trouble us. The first one is ego a symbolic concept of the workings of our mind. Our egos hold the constrictions, concerns, and difficulties we accepted in childhood. In effect, we have trained ourselves into our ego shapes. It is as if we operate from a framework toward life that may or may not be valid anymore, but yet we have trained ourselves in this way. Those around us shape many of our ego's concerns, much like the way my mother's fear of water affected me. Robert Fulgham once said, don't worry that children never listen to you. Worry that they are always watching you. A reminder that our children are doing the same thing we once did, learning from the adults in their lives by things they hear, observe, or sense. Yes, or sense. Sensations count here because many of our ego's concerns were never expressed, were never discussed. 
They just operate in a subliminal and an oblivious compartment hidden from our daily awareness. The second mischief maker mentioned by Alma is narrow-minded views. These are opinions gleaned and shaped by conscious choice. While our ego sense is never abrogated through our conscious decisions, we are looking here at patterns of life we chose to develop. These narrow-minded choices eventually become so important to us, it is like they are written in stone. Sadly, it is difficult to shift the view of those who are well set into their narrow-mindedness. As Christopher Hitchens observed, I learned that very often the most intolerant and narrow-minded people are those who congratulate themselves on their tolerance and open mindedness. <laughs> The stone to sand metaphor. Each of us carries views we have carved into stone. They may be narrow-minded views. They may be contained in our ego. Yet, we often do not recognize them. We are invited to let go of the trappings of ego and narrow-mindedness and find a way to remain open to new insights, new truths, and maybe even a new and improved approach to life. This is a shift. It is a shift for our doing. For me, at one time, was absolving myself of my fear of water. And I did this because I wanted to learn to swim. The fates of life moved me in a direction that I wanted and needed to move. And I asked at that time, if others could swim, shouldn't I be able to swim too? One of the joys of this faith is that we accept different religious and spiritual orientations. While many churches welcome those who are willing to accept what they proscribe, Unitarian Universalists have carved a more accepting path. Our welcome hopes you will be willing, that you are willing to traverse your own spiritual pathway are willing to dig into the truths that call to you, are willing to allow the winds to blow around and through you, for those winds are always there, and are willing to study, learn, shift, change, improve, and welcome others who pursue a similar journey. That's a long sentence, I know. It is basically a move from a prescribed faith one with creeds, to the acceptance of one another, and encouragement to spiritual growth in this congregation. A statement taken from our third principle. So we return to question four, and there is a bit more to this question. It reads, the parable of Musa and Naqib reminds us that when someone hurts us, we should write it in the sand so that the winds of forgiveness can blow it away. But when someone is kind to us, we should write it in stone so we will never forget. Do you follow this wisdom or do you have it backwards? An anonymous commentator says, let go of how you thought your life should be and embrace the life that is trying to work its way into your consciousness. One grace I see here at CCUU, and I mean this is a grace, is that we who gather here have been taking steps to remain open to each other. We 
recognize that there will be a process of growth. We are open to change. And a covenant of right relationship also provides us help. They have led us thus far, but this journey is not completed. So we must consider what is happening to realize the differences to be found in people who remain open. Jesus spoke of a process similar to writing Hurts and Sand and Kindnesses and Stone in the Beatitudes, a portion of his Sermon on the Mount. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The model of life expressed in the Beatitudes has been seen as outside the norm of what anyone could ever be able to do. It seems so big, so huge, but I have noticed it is considered by many to be an ideal, to be an unobtainable goal to actually be the way Jesus describes. But you know, it feels different to me when I consider that text and compare it to writing hurts and sand and kindnesses and stone. Because an approach of remaining fully open to that process of life is the approach taken by the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the merciful, and the peacemakers. As we move forward, as we live in close contact with family and friends of the one hand, as we reach out and join in the work of this church community on the other hand, may we be blessed because we have worked together learning to write our hurts in the sand and our kindnesses in stone. And may we always consider new ways to do this better. And then, may our lives be filled with mercy peace, and love. May the love in your hearts find love in the hearts of those around you.